Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin. I am here with today's co-host, Kristen Palacy, mom, almost chiropractor, and newly trained doula. Welcome back. Thank you. Our guest today is deeply loved and extremely well-respected. He is a giant in the field of obstetric anesthesia. Dr. Mark Zukowski, MD, has personally helped more than 27,000 women give birth and has been chief of obstetric anesthesia for more than 152,000 deliveries at hospitals both in New York and here in California. Dr. Zukowski has served on the board of directors for the California Society of Anesthesiologists, where he is currently past president, a past president, and the Society of Obstetric Anesthesia and Perinatology, where he's currently president-elect. He also serves on many committees dedicated to patient safety. Dr. Zukowski created the Safe Baby System over a decade ago and has authored books and articles to help educate the public about giving birth, including his book, C-Section, How to Avoid, Prepare for, and Recover from Your Cesarean, which is currently available on Amazon.com. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. I'm really excited to talk to you. You have a very unique perspective and obviously a wealth of experience. Uh, And there's so many questions that we get about anesthesiology as people explore their options for childbirth. And your mission is clearly very similar to our mission, which is about information, compiling information, accurate information, delivering that information, and helping people make more informed choices. So I couldn't be more happy to have you on the program today. Um, The Safe Baby System, that was some of your original writing. What was that about? That was really about educating uh, women and and their partners, men and otherwise, about um, the choices, what goes on during pregnancy, vaginal delivery, uh, really oriented towards letting people know how they can participate um, and not just be done to, but be an active participant, know what's going on, and have a better birth experience for it. Did you know in medical school that this is what you wanted to do? (laughs) Uh, No, no. How did that come about? Well, originally, I, I loved the relationship I had as a kid with my pediatrician, which is what drove me, one of the things that drove me to go to medical school. Hmm. Um, so originally, I was thinking, you know, maybe a family practice type situation. But then when I rotated through anesthesiology, it was sandwiched between a month of surgery on either end. And it was just fun. Um, you know, personally, I'm kind of analytical introvert. Mm-hmm. even though I've learned to overcome that. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was just fun. You got to think, you know, uh, you have to use physiology, pharmacology. It's acute care, really. The field of anesthesiology involves a lot of critical care medicine. You know, uh, the difference between doing, for me personally, the primary care versus anesthesiology was acute versus chronic care. I get someone and I have to watch out for them, you know, fix them. I usually get only an hour or two to fix them mm-hmm. if something's wrong and then, you know, make them better and move on to the next person. I see. And within a anesthesiology, there's diverse places you can go. Yes. Everything, you know, nowadays tends to become sub, even more subspecialized. Specialized, and yeah. I, I took a liking to, you know, obstetric anesthesia, partly because I like interacting with, you know, the women and, and the dads and the other moms and uh, getting the feedback and helping them. And well, I think uh, from a chiropractic perspective, I would say I'm on a similar boat. You become a chiropractor and you do general chiropractic. There's a few subspecialties. There's pediatric and there's sports chiropractic and geriatric chiropractic. Uh, I stumbled into obstetric chiropractic. And the the you know for me, being part of that journey with uh, either a woman or a couple, um, and then it's such a happy time, you know, for most of them, and uh, it's a transitional time for everyone, and uh, it's different than chronic pain. You know, up until then, you're doing a lot of some acute and a lot of chronic pain, and then it's just a whole different world. So I, I imagine it's similar for obstetrics as well, uh, for anesthesiologists to get more into obstetrics. And Kristen's, like, uh, really exploring it all. Um, yeah. I mean, when did you realize you want to do 
um, pregnancy? Well, I was an athlete most of my life, so I got that's how I figured out like what chiropractic was, be- getting treated as an athlete, and so that's what I thought going into school. I was going to be sports chiropractor, mm-hmm. and then. Uh, you know, chiropractic school wasn't interesting enough, so I had a baby. <laughs> and, um, and you like to I, juggle. Yeah, exactly. And I just found that it was um, it was hard to get good care. Uh, and then there was just so many things to know that I didn't know. <laughs> when you were pregnant? When I was pregnant. Mm-hmm. And so then I did a lot of research because I'm also very analytical. And I was like, wow, how do people get a hold of this information? And even being educated, it was a lot to take in because you have all these emotions and things. So I was like, you know, I really want to help women get more more exposure to how to have a birth that they want and be happy with it, you know? So that's why. Well, I'm glad you did. Me too. Mm, we <laughs> love having you around. Thanks. <clears throat> Dr. Kelsey, you also, because I think that... Generally speaking, in the holistic camp, you have fans of holistic approaches, and in the medical camp, you have fans of uh, medical approaches. Um, I feel like that you are somewhere in the middle where, not that you're not a fan of the medical approach, but you're a fan of people learning all their options and picking an approach. Am I putting words into your mouth, or is that somewhat accurate? That is, uh, yes, that is very accurate. And I, I appreciate all sides of what's going on, and really, I'm there to... Number one, as a physician anesthesiologist, I'm there to, you know, for patient safety and to take care of mom and while she's pregnant, mom and baby, while other people do what they need to do. But the approach is really there to help and empower, you know, pregnant women and make the experience better. So when it comes to childbirth, there's all sorts of different choices. Some people have babies at home, other people at a birthing center, and others at a hospital, most at a hospital. Uh, some with midwives, some with obstetricians, um, or even uh, family physicians. Um, and then, of course, some choose for medicated or unmedicated. Some choose vaginal, and some choose cesarean. Uh, in, in From your perspective, do those all seem like reasonable options for different people? Yeah, I mean, we're all the same, but we're all totally different. And our bodies are different and our what's going on, both medically, uh, emotionally, psychologically. Mm-hmm. And so at the higher level that I try to practice at, um, you know, you're dealing with, with all of those. I have a term that I coined on in an article and sort of used on the lecture circuit. Uh, I talk a lot about psychoanesthesia. It's not just about the medication Mm -hmm. you're giving when I'm teaching residents, but it's about you walk in the room, what do you read, you know, on the faces in the room, what's going on? Are they nervous? Are they, Mm -hmm. you know, excited? How do you deal with it? And how to really deal with all sides. Yeah. So, but as an anesthesiologist, your approach is not everybody who has a baby should be somewhat anesthetized. No, it's it's up to the individual. Right. Everyone has different needs and different thresholds, and a lot of it is changed by what's going on. You know, there's a large interplay between what I do and what the obstetric care team is doing. Mm-hmm. You know, what medication are they going up on? Are they using oxytocin? Not, you know, is what's going on with the blood pressure? You know, there are things I can do to help improve um, mom's health and how much blood and oxygen is going to the baby. Sure. So every birth is different and different factors come up that may make an intervention more or less uh, helpful. Right. But everything's geared towards that patient safety. How do I optimize mom's health and the baby's health? And also to some degree comfort. Yeah. And the degree of comfort. And everyone, and different people want different degrees of comfort. And different types of comfort measure. Meaning some yeah. people, there's a lot of holistic comfort measures, which we'll spend a whole nother podcast doing. Uh, and then there's also these medical comfort measures. So I made a, a little list of different medical comfort measures, and I'd like to pick your brain about them. I sort of think I'm going from least to most uh, lightest to strongest, sort of speak. Um, nitrous oxide, laughing gas, uh, seems to be used in labor to help people uh, – cope through the intensity. And uh, in other countries, I think it's more common than it is here, but it, recently in California, a couple of the hospitals and some birthing centers started using it. What are your thoughts on nitrous oxide? What is it? What does it do? And um, what do you think about its use for labor and delivery? Yeah. So as you said, nitrous oxide has been around for a while. Um, it has been used 
more commonly in Europe and uh, Aust Western Europe and Australia um, to help with labor pain. Uh, you, it, it's administered through a mask, so you have to inhale through the mask and you're supposed to exhale through the mask so you don't contaminate the room with the nitrous oxide. Oh, really? So everybody gets a little dose of laughing gas? Well, if you don't breathe back into the mask, <laughs> that's correct. You have, to, you have to use it. You have to use it correctly. So, you know, it, it helps um, to a varying degree. It's different for different women. Um, in terms of pure analgesic effect, meaning it reduces the pain as as measured by scientific standards. You know, it's kind of weak, a little mm -hmm. bit weak. Um, it's more actually of the way it works. Biologically, it's closer to what we call, in my field, a dissociative anesthetic, meaning you, you're feeling something, but you just don't care. Mm -hmm. Hence the name laughing gas. That's how it seems to look from my perspective. I've been to a few births now where people use laughing gas, and it's not that they don't feel the pain. It does, it's just that they're not as anxious about the pain or the pain doesn't seem to bother them as much. Exactly. So... Um, yeah, you know, in terms of, like I said, if you're looking at pain score, it, it reduces it a little bit, not a lot. Mm -hmm. um, there was even one study that compared it to air and randomized and said it was no different. But most people seem to feel it, it helps a little bit. It's uh, What's nice about it is there is a sense of control, mm -hmm. right? The woman um, self-administers it. You can start, you can stop. You do need to breathe it in actually like 45 seconds before the contraction mm -hmm. so that you inhale it and it work, goes to the brain it works for the peak of the contraction. Right. So, uh, But on those fancy little monitors you have, we can tell right when the contraction's starting. So, Some people contract regularly. Some people are a little more irregular. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it seems like she, the last birth I was at where, where a woman was using it, she got the sense like a contraction was about to come before it actually came. And then she would take a puff of the nitrous oxide and seem to, like, get a little bit more relaxed. It, she, there was still clearly some uh, intensity, significant intensity during the contraction, but it just – the best way I can describe it is it just didn't seem to bother her. Mm -hmm. um, and then if for some reason she didn't get it in time or she was – you know, she went to the bathroom, she wasn't near it, and a contraction would come, it would bother her more. So – she just felt like in that particular case, it was a birthing center, so she also had the tub. And the combination between the warm water and the tub and the nitrous oxide was really helpful for her. Is there a, a downside in your mind to nitrous except for uh, giving everybody else laughing gas if you don't use it right? I wouldn't use it for a long time. What about the baby? Are there known effects for the baby from nitrous? Uh, well, the, it does cross the placenta and reach the baby, okay. and uh, so far they haven't seen any effects in the babies. Mm -hmm. Again, from the biologic perspective of knowing what it's doing to the enzymes, et cetera, you know, you could hypothesize there might be some kind of effect, but uh, at the moment we don't know it. what it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts on nitrous? Uh, oh, I do have a thought on nitrous. Yeah. Actually, I've seen a couple of people use it and hate it. Either it made them anxious or nauseous, or one person said she felt like she was being smothered. Hmm. Well, yeah, exactly. So some of the things, right, it does make some people can feel a little dizzy, as you said, lightheaded, uh, because you have to breathe in and out of the mask. Some mm -hmm. people uh, can be claustrophobic, and sometimes it can give, because of the chemical, the way it works in the body, um, it can be a dissociative anesthetic, but some people can occasionally get dysphoric or feel bad from it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So those are things to look out for because in all those cases, they easy. just they try it once or Stop. twice and if they don't right, like exactly. it, they that's just don't easy use enough it. To, that's one of the benefits, right, is you have the, the, the woman has the control. So it has a quick half-life? I mean, because it just seems to yes. only last for like a minute. Yeah, that's correct. Because it's relatively insoluble in the body, it's a sort of a fast on, fast off. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Can we talk about uh, intravenous drugs or intramuscular? Meaning as another option, so instead of uh, jumping to epidural, which we'll talk about shortly, um, there are options to inject drugs into a laboring woman's body that will either decrease the pain on a greater scale than what we were talking about nitrous, but not necessarily um, take away her ability to be ambulatory. 
Uh, what are some of those drugs? Well, there are several narcotics that can be used. Uh, the older ones, like uh, Dem uh, trade name Demerol chemical meperidine, used to be used a lot, but uh, <clears throat> that can make you sleepy and can make the baby sleepy. Mm -hmm. uh, and the is sleepy bad for the mom? Like if she's in the middle of labor, been laboring for a long time, is sleepy not a good thing? Um, a little bit of sleepy would be okay earlier in labor. That's fine. Sometimes they even do, uh, it's called like morphine rest if you're in very mm -hmm. early labor. They'll give you some morphine to let you relax and take a nap. Uh, that's what, intravenous? A um, intravenous or, I mean, any of the narcotics we talk about can be given IV or as an injection. Injections. Yeah. Intramuscular. Yeah, intramuscular, even uh, into the, under the skin, subcut. Subcutaneous. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes. you said the older drugs like Demerol. Yeah, and so, so uh, yeah, Demerol, the chemical is meperidine, has an active metabolite, normaperidine, and that can make the baby sleepy for a long time because it has a very, the baby's not able to metabolize it. Do all the narcotics go across the barrier into the baby? Um, pretty much all of them will cross to some extent. Okay, so we have to look out for what the effects might be on the baby as well. Correct. Um, you know, morphine is used, uh, as we said, in earlier labor. It'll last usually two to four hours, um, as will the, the meperidine. Uh, there are some mixed agonist-antagonist narcotics, so they both take away the pain, but you can't really overdose. I know that sounds... Are those newer drugs? I mean, to get, yeah. Well, I mean, too, I guess overdosing is one of the concerns. If, yeah. if, if you overdose on these drugs, these are central nervous system depressants? Yeah. All nar so all narcotics um, take away the pain, but they also have the side effect of they can cause itching, nausea, sedation. Mm -hmm. um, the, the two mixed an agonist antagonists, so that kind of it, it works, but it also kind of doesn't work at the receptor, butorphanol and albufene. Uh, also lasts two to four hours. Some hospitals prefer to use that. So the mixed agonist combined an antagonist narcotics, they'll occupy and stimulate the receptor, but not as much as just a pure agonist. Okay. So you can't actually, it's, it's hard a, to take, give so much that you stop breathing. Maybe I can back up a little bit. So the way these drugs work is they're, they're attaching to pain receptors? Uh, yes. And not allowing them to transmit pain. Yeah, more or less. So they block them from transmitting pain. But the downside of those, they can start to shut down your central nervous system activity, like breathing. Well, too much, will you'll get the side effects of sedation and eventually uh, not breathing. Right. So in that respect, the mixed agonist antagonist might be a little safer if you're doing large doses, but mm -hmm. they try not to do that anymore. Okay. And then you have the what seems to be more common um, you have fentanyl and ultra short acting remifentanil, mm -hmm. which actually is also more a little more popular in Europe than in America. Um, and one of the benefits is that they have a, they don't last that long. Mm -hmm. So fentanyl, which is one of the more commonly used ones um, currently, you know it'll work for maybe an hour and then you'll your body will excrete it. So it gives maybe gives her a little break from the pain for an hour. Um. Exactly. No, It'll you, take the edge off and reduce the pain. So the pain score, it's a true analgesic, meaning the pain score will decrease. Mm -hmm. You don't feel the pain. It doesn't. The pain impulses don't get transmitted up to the brain, and then you don't perceive it the same. But, um, yeah, it lasts just under an hour. Is it still possible for somebody to get administered fentanyl and then it not do anything or something similar to that effect where they they don't respond well to these uh, types of of drugs. Have you ever seen that before in your experience? Well, everyone has a different uh, pain threshold and and sensitivity to medications mm -hmm. uh -huh. over uh, for for almost everything, um, especially for narcotics mm -hmm. and analgesics like that. So sometimes you get people who you only need a little bit to get the desired effect, and some people, you know, if you've smoked. I'm not encouraging it. But I'm just saying, <laughs> as smokers, people who have been drinking alcohol, 
you know, they're used to metabolizing stuff, and so you need, they, they would usually require more. If they've been taking pain pills during pregnancy, if they have, you know, back pain, pelvic girdle pain, and they've been prescribed an opiate, then, yeah, they're going to need a lot more. So I don't see this narcotic, um, I don't see this type of narcotic injected or intravenous narcotics that often during labor anymore. I think uh, for a lot of women, when you tell them that the drugs go across the barrier and you're giving your baby narcotics, they just don't want to do it. Um, in terms of anesthesiologists, is is this a less preferred method or is there another reason why we don't see it that often? Or is it just people, when they want the pain relief, they want it to be longer lasting, more like an epidural? Yeah. Uh, some people know that they want an epidural because they want you know the highest degree of pain relief. Sometimes they'll use fentanyl for, you know, early labor as a temporizing measure. You know, woman's not sure how she's going to handle stuff. Start with uh, one or two doses of fentanyl, and then, no, I still have a long time to go. Let me get that epidural and get, you know, more pain relief. For longer, that doesn't make me sleepy. Mm -hmm. I don't just even see it offered very often. But when I have seen it offered, like there was maybe a 35, 36-hour labor, she just needed a little break. And um, I think they gave her morphine. And uh, for like the next two or three hours, she just sort of fell asleep between contractions. She'd wake up with a contraction, but not in the same type of intensity, and then fall right back asleep for another five minutes or so and wake up. And after it wore off, she just had the energy to keep going for the rest of that labor with no more medication. But it just, I don't see it offered very often. It's not, is, you're saying it's not really a conscious decision not to offer it? It's. Well, I think it's where you're, uh, you're hanging out. Hmm. But I mean, what's I good mean, about in, the podcast big, is now people in, can in know that it's an option they can ask for. Right. Yeah. No, but then I think in most, most hospitals, they offer a narcotic, whichever brand they use according to local mm -hmm. practice as a stop, intermediate stop cap. Got it. Okay. Um, and there are some, like yeah, I said, like, we don't want to get overly detailed, but, you know, there are some differences in the different medications and that mainly have to do with how long they last and sort of the how well people metabolize them or not. Is there a point in labor where it's too late for the narcotic option? Well, if you're about to deliver, they don't like to do it because then that's the window for most likely to... If you're giving the medicine through the IV, mm -hmm. you're going to have a very high blood level. Even right. if it's momentarily, and that's when you get pharmacologically most of the drive to go across the placenta to, to the baby. baby. Oh, I see. And so it's so. most likely to affect the baby if you're going to give it and deliver soon. Mm -hmm. So if, the baby can come out uh, basically. Yeah, a little sleepy groggy. from on yeah. the narcotics, right. or potentially if it, if it's too strong, not breathing. Yeah. I mean, uh, just like an adult, a baby uh, who's narcotized looks the same, reacts the same as an adult who's narcotized. Right. So, you know, as long as you're stimulating them, you know, rubbing their backs or talking to them, they'll start to. Yeah, they they react. act normally, and then you leave them alone, and they kind of drift off and fall asleep, and you know, potentially, depending on the amount of narcotic, in theory, could you know, breathe less. There's also a drug that can block the effects of narcotic, right? If they overdose or. Yeah, so anybody who's gotten a typical narcotic, you can reverse it with uh, naloxone, which is a... Narcan. Narcan, that's the trade name, yeah. So it's a pure antagonist at that narcotic mu receptor we were talking, mentioned earlier. Got it. Okay, I'm learning a lot. Me too. And uh, I want to keep going. We're going to take a little break for a word from our sponsor. Uh, stay tuned. We're going to be right back with Dr. Mark Zikowski. And continue our discussion as we move on to uh, epidurals and spinal blocks right here on the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. <laughs> Why would you put your baby to sleep in a cardboard box? To keep them safe. A few years ago, infant safety expert Amber Croker was fed up with infant sleep death that occurred when parents would use unsafe sleep spaces like bouncy seats, sofas, and breastfeeding pillows to nap their babies because the crib wasn't nearby. Heartbroken, Amber did research and learned about the Baby Box, a humble cardboard box with a firm mattress and a fitted sheet that offers a safe, portable, convenient sleep space for a baby's first six months of life. 
The baby box helped Finland achieve one of the lowest infant mortality rates in the world. Amber was inspired and partnered with pediatricians and packaging experts to create her modern interpretation of this tradition. It's called the Smitten Sleep System, and it's made right here in the USA. The Smitten is a thoughtfully designed bassinet box. Put your baby to sleep in Smitten and easily carry them from room to room, ensuring that your baby is always safely close by. The Smitten is made of durable, lightweight, and environmentally friendly corrugate. The trendy, gender-neutral designs look great in any nursery and throughout your home. Smitten is carefully crafted from non-toxic materials and inks, and it easily assembles in five minutes or less. Most of all, Smitten is designed for safe sleep and adheres to all of the safe sleep recommendations of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Order a Smitten for yourself or as a unique, practical, and safety-enhancing baby gift today. Use code INFORMED for $10 off a Woodland Smitten. Visit pipandgrow.com. That's P-I-P-A-N-D-G-R-O-W. Pipandgrow.com. Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin. I'm here with our co-host, Kristen Palacy, and our guest, obstetric anesthesiologist, Dr. Mark Sikowski. And uh, we were talking about uh, medical options for helping with pain during labor. We talked about nitrous oxide, and we talked about narcotics that can be injected uh, intramuscularly, intravenously, or subcutaneously. Uh, just as a little review, the nitrous, not not your favorite thing. Um, it's not a very high pain reliever, a very strong pain reliever. Um, but it it you get to control it yourself. And um, for many women, it seems to just help just what they need to get through it. Uh, the injectable drugs are narcotics, and um, they do cross the barrier to the baby. I think just on that merit alone, a lot of our patients wouldn't want to do it. Um, we were talking during the break how, like, they don't eat non-organic strawberries and things. So giving narcotics to the baby for a lot of them doesn't sound good. But you were saying that it goes to the baby, and especially if it's early in labor, it gets back to the mother. Right. Mom will metabolize it, and actually it will cross back. The stuff that goes to the baby will cross back to mom, and mom will excrete it, being um, the good mama she is. <laughs> and just yeah. take care of it for the baby. So if it's... Not if delivery isn't imminent, you know, there's not going to be an effect on the baby at the time of delivery. Yeah, what what good mother wouldn't take the narcotics out of her baby and excrete them? <clears throat> and then, so then, in terms of the pain relief effectiveness, that's uh, stronger, much stronger than uh, nitrous, and but not as strong as the Holy Grail here, which is the epidural options. And I'm confused a little bit because you hear terms like spinal, spinal block, epidural, combined spinal epidural. Help me out. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, as you said, they're similar but different. So epidural is the location you're going to put the medication. So okay. it's, it's in the back. But all, but all everything you just spoke about, the approach is the same, which is the lower back. Okay. But epidural. Is it a specific spinal level? Uh, usually it's somewhere between, that's right, you're a chiropractor, mm -hmm. uh, L2, 3, or L3, 4. Okay. Um, so epidural epi means around, dura is the sac that contains the spinal cord fluid and nerves. Mm -hmm. So for the epidural, you're giving a larger volume of medicine because it spreads up and down, left and right, and actually numbs up each nerve root as it's going out to the body. Okay. So you can, your body's feeling the pain, it's sending the impulses, but it's stopped at the level of the nerve root. Okay. So spinal anesthesia, you go a few millimeters deeper. Well, I'll just stop you there for one second because that was fascinating what you just said. The pain you're talking about from her body, like from her belly, from her pelvis, from her back, that's coming, all those little nerves that are out there are sending information into the spinal cord up to the brain, but you are blocking it at the nerve root where that where that comes into the spinal cord. Uh, correct. The local anesthetic will, you know, just like at the dentist where they inject it and it numbs up the nerve so you don't feel. That's the same basic principle with the epidural. So those peripheral nerves are still doing their job and, and picking up the pain. It just gets blocked before it hits the spinal cord. Correct. 
Oh, amazing. Yeah. So, uh, and then the difference we said with spinal anesthesia, which normally is just used for surgery. Mm-hmm. Is um, that like a spinal a block? Is that the, yeah. am I using the right term? People say spinal block. Okay. Uh, so that you're injecting, you're going the different shaped needle, specially designed to reduce the incidence of headache afterwards. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Uh, so it's, it goes a couple to a few millimeters deeper, penetrates that sac, the dura, mm-hmm. and injects a smaller quantity of medicine, local anesthetic, and potentially some narcotic, directly into the s- spinal fluid. Okay. So the benefit for that is it works, kicks in faster than an epidural. Okay. Um, and it's just because it's a little bit easier and kicks in faster. For a C-section, that's the most common anesthetic used. Is it a, a different drug? So the they're the same types of drugs, like just the quantity is different because okay. of the location. So it's a both... Both epidural and spinal anesthesia use local anesthetic, and usually um, that's assisted by some type of narcotic. Okay, so we have uh, so many questions popping into my head, and I'm um, sure Christians as well. First of all, well, I'm the, here to help. Thank you, and I'm so <laughs> glad you're here to help. The difference between an anesthetic and a narcotic, and the anesthesia means uh, something that blocks a sensation. I'm just defining. So we're just defining. So usually, most commonly, an epidural is used to provide pain relief during labor in Mm -hmm. the venue we're talking about. So that's labor analgesia, or taking away the pain. Okay. If you've got the epidural and you wind up needing a cesarean delivery, then I can give more medicine, stronger local anesthetic to totally numb you up and provide surgical anesthesia. As you mentioned, anesthesia is no sensation. So that way you can be awake and enjoy sort of the, the birth and seeing the baby. So other sensations besides pain, like proprioception or pulling or tugging? Right. You, and generally that goes away. Usually you still feel a little bit of pulling and tugging, okay. uh, partly because it's not just giving birth by cesarean is not I was going to say it's, it's not a delicate procedure. Mm-hmm. It's not like just a little bit of pulling or tugging, it's, right? They, right? Although they cut an opening into the through the, the lower part of the belly and into the uterus, they're still pushing the baby out for you. Right. So, you mean from above? Then. From above, so right. So there's, there's mechanical yeah, so force exactly. required to get the baby out. Right, just like if uh, your arms, the example I usually give, if, if I, your arm's numb and I tug on your arm, you're still going to feel it in your shoulder. Right. So even if you're... You're numb, and typically so that you're comfortable when they're doing the cesarean delivery, which is abdominal surgery, we we make you numb all the way up to your mid-chest, you know, around where the nipple line is, Mm -hmm. just because the inner lining of the abdomen comes all the way up, right, to by the diaphragm. So you need to be numb all the way up to your chest so that you're comfortable for the surgery. Okay. But you still will feel a little bit of pressure tugging. Okay, so that's that's an uh, generally during labor you give an epidural, so that's going outside the sp- the dural sac. It's not piercing through the dural sac. Correct. Where the nerve roots are, uh, with your spinal block, you go a little deeper into the spinal sac, and um, the drugs go into the cerebrospinal fluid. Yes. So, the, like I said, it's similar types of medications, just the quantity you need to get the effect you want is different. More drug, and but why, why deeper into the sac? Well, to reach the spinal fluid, yeah. you, know, you just need to go. You got to get into the sac, but why the spinal fluid? I feel like something just popped into my head. <laughs> when you're doing the epidural outside the dural sac, you said you're numbing the nerve roots, right? So when you actually get the drug into the dura and into the cerebrospinal fluid, are you numbing the spine itself, the spinal cord? Yes. Okay. Um, there, in your mind, is there a, um, a downside to having an epidural during childbirth, during labor? Is there a downside? Well, well there are negative side effects that are potential. Right. I mean, like any... there are things we watch out for. So um, there's... 
about a little less than 1% chance of getting a headache afterwards. So with epidural, you're trying to stay just short of that sac, the dura that contains the spinal cord flow nerves. Mm -hmm. No, but you are using a needle to place the little tube. So even though it's designed to push it away, you can you know, make a little rent in it or you could move at the wrong time. So if you make a hole in the dura with either spinal or epidural needle, mm -hmm. you know, you can get that. Um, the old term was spinal headache. But yeah. Yeah, the correct term is postural puncture headache. Okay. So, so you can get a headache. You know, there'd be... Is that because fluid from inside gets out or fluid from outside gets in? Yes, you're asking excellent questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I liken it to say it's like your spinal fluid is kind of like a shock absorber. So if you make a hole and you leak out some of the fluid, your shocks are low. So you're okay you're, when you're flat, mm -hmm. you're fine, you have no headache, and then you sit up and things just sag a little bit. Okay, it's because you, you lost some of the pressure that that's, should be inside the dural sac. Right. How do you fix that? Because it's not just a headache, it's like a monster headache. It, it is a bad headache, yes. So, right, the two things that will fix that are time, because you the whole wall... The fluid. Well, you'll regenerate the fluid, but you'll also just the hole that we'll was made itself. will seal up. Oh, I see. So you stop leaking. So uh, time, because you'll, you'll just heal. And uh, the other thing which would make it go away right away um, is called an epidural blood patch, where we take blood out of your arm and sterilely put it in the back to kind of put a plug into that hole so you stop leaking. Just roughly <laughs> around the area where, it's, yeah, where same the puncture area. took place? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, how, how long does that take to work? Um, it works pretty much right away. Oh, okay. Uh, you don't want to do it within the first 24 hours because the success rate is lower, but after the first 24 hours. When do they usually start to experience the signs of headache, if there is? Uh... Um, usually in a day or two afterwards, not, not usually immediately. As the fluid's trickling out and the pressure's going down? Right, and then you've delivered, and then you're getting up and walking around more, so uh, then now gravity. you've got... Yeah, gravity and the pressure starts makes to drop. Sense. Yeah, yeah. So you, you um, that makes sense. Bit. And you said so when you do the when you want to get into the spinal sac when you, into the dural sac with a spinal or a spinal block, um, the needle is specially designed so that it tries to. I mean, you have to get in there, so you must make a puncture. Is it meant to like self seal? <laughs> Sharp questions. Yes. So the the spinal needles we use for pregnant women mm -hmm. are especially designed there. It's a kind of, instead of a normal needle, mm -hmm. medical needle is, has a sharp edge to it because yeah. it's meant to, to advance and penetrate. But the spinal needles we use are especially designed instead of a, a sharp cutting edge. It's a kind of a rounded blunt tip. Mm -hmm. um, so it's made instead of cutting the membrane and leaving a little hole, it's made to kind of just sort of penetrate but part the fibers because you have elastic fibers in that sac so it'll tend to clamp back down afterwards. Oh, you're just trying to sort of push your way in instead of poke your way in? Yes. Oh. That's interesting. I had no idea. That's really brilliant whoever thought of that. How long have, it, have those needles been in use? Let's see. When I was training, which was a while ago, we'll say late 80s, uh, yeah, they were just coming to the U.S. Oh, okay. So most of your tenure... So I have a question. So some women feel back pain or say that they feel back pain for many years after at the site of the epidural. Is that something that can be medically explained or is that like um, just, is there a residual? You're talking pain? about localized low back pain? Mm-hmm. Right. Like at which the we sometimes site? see in the office for sometimes months, three, six, nine months after an epidural, they'll just be localized irritation, just pain right there. Is that common that you know of? Um, Women experience it. It's not that common. Okay. I don't see it often, and I do see a lot of women after having a baby. But when you see it, it's like you can almost see the puncture spot, and it's right around there um, on her low back. I always wondered if sometimes maybe fluid got trapped in between the tissues or something like that. Well, you know, usually it's common to be sore for a day or two, just like um, I say you get a shot anywhere, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, a vaccine or something. The muscle, the area will be a little sore just from having put fluid in there. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you 
there are some women, not many, who say, yeah, they can feel the spot afterwards. But it, usually, even if they feel it for a while, mm-hmm. eventually, it eventually goes, goes away. away. Okay. Yeah. Including my sister-in-law. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah, it's like that? a thing that many women talk about why they don't want it or I don't know, but, but they felt it. You know, I think sometimes mm. they... I literally, I, I my own experience, I was getting my blood drawn for um, one of the tests and I was pregnant and the lady told me, don't get an epidural because, I mean, I had mine years ago and in the cold, I feel pain. And mm. she wasn't the only person who told me that during my pregnancy. And I was like, really? And I don't think it has to do with that, but for whatever reason, it has that association. So I was just wondering if that's something that they, just because they know that they had that there, it's something that they they think is a part of that, you know? Yeah, that is an astute observation because the, yeah. the high-quality prospective studies, the incidence of back pain after delivery is the same whether you get an epidural or not. Oh, interesting. Yeah. You interesting. Know, I like in uh, giving birth and pushing, like running a marathon, which is, you know, if I just went out, I'm in decent shape, you know, I go to the gym, et cetera. But, you know, if I went out and ran a marathon, I would not be able to walk the next day. Right. If, right. I, if I even finished. Yeah. I do have one patient who had four babies and three of them with an epidural, one without. And every time she got the epidural, she had six to nine months of back pain right around the puncture site. And on the fourth one, her third one was fairly quick. And on the fourth one, she's just like, I should just deal with the, the intensity of labor for a few hours and not have six Good months pain. of back pain. But I don't see it commonly. Yeah. Um, I do have a few questions. One is, uh, is there a point where it's too late to get an epidural? Yeah, it's too late when the head's hanging out. Okay, so up until <laughs> that moment, how long does it take to kick in usually? Only a few minutes, but that partly depends on the medication used and the, the technique. Uh, a few other questions. One of them is, um, I sort of touched on it before, but we talked about potential downside of, uh, of epidural administration being the spinal headache, being the old term, spinal headache. Um, what are some of the other potential side effects? And the question that I get all the time, and I don't know the answer to, I can only tell you observationally, is does it slow down labor? Does it have the potential to slow down labor? Okay, so the answer, the first part of your question first. Uh, so the other things we said, 1% chance of headache, right. rare chance of something like infection at the side, bleeding, or you know, very rare chance for damage to a nerve. Um, the blood pressure can change a little bit, so we monitor the blood pressure and give some fluid beforehand. So, yes, uh, epidural got a, a bad name a <laughs> long time ago uh, in terms of that. But the better study, quality studies, where it's randomized, prospective, and the obstetric management is controlled. Mm-hmm. So does not affect the C-section rate. It uh, doesn't affect first stage of labor, so time till you dilate to complete, right? Um, uh, most studies show there's a slight increase in second stage of labor, the time when you would go be from complete to push the baby out. Pushing, yeah. Uh, with no adverse effect on mom or baby. So, that, you know, it might extend 15, 20 minutes. Uh, the overall labor time. The second stage, yeah. Oh, I see, the second stage of labor. Yeah, I mean, sometimes... Women just describe it, maybe because it's in their heads sometimes, but it actually looks like this. Labor is progressing, it's progressing, it's progressing, and then they get the epidural and just things, the contractions. You don't sometimes see the contractions peter out for a bit or? I mean, I've seen both. I've definitely seen the other way, too. I just yeah. recently had a client who was laboring at home for a hospital birth, but she was laboring at home for 24 hours and got to one centimeter. As soon as she got her epidural, she was at 10 centimeters in a couple of hours. So I definitely think it can go the other way. It just seems, at least anecdotally, observing women in labor, that sometimes um, the progress that they're making, the momentum that they have, does come to a s- slowdown or stand still even after they they do get a uh, an epidural. And then you also just have to wonder about the role that ambulation plays in helping bring a baby down, the gravity and the movement, and, uh, and taking that away. I know at one of the hospitals you work with, they have a pretty interesting um, program for trying to keep women upright still, even in the bed, and kind of rolling around and moving. 
to simulate that ambulation? You asked, I think, about three questions in there, and I'm trying to Sorry. remember all three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the, like I said, the better prospective studies on the global level, there's no change in length of labor, although as an individual, things will vary. Sure. Okay. Um, That's fair. Yeah. So uh, that's partly, I feel, a moot point because common obstetric practices use oxytocin to speed the labor along. And if you're not contracting every two to three minutes, right, it's very common to give oxytocin until you get that. Well, the only reason it's not necessarily a moot point is because a woman may choose to hold off on an epidural if she knows that will lead to potentially having to stimulate labor with artif- synthetic oxytocin. Right, but then in the, probably the best prospective study, early versus late up and early, there was no difference. Because of the administration of oxytocin, of pitocin? Well, the, using the epidural early versus late, mm-hmm. later, yeah, there was no difference in anything. Okay. So like I said, you can't uh, you can't guarantee what happens with an individual, but you can only measure what happens, what happens to, to many people, and there's no difference when you measure many people. Okay. Yeah, I'm just because I was just wondering if there's no difference because we use other interventions to account or contra to work against the the things that might slow labor down. Meaning, is there no difference in the length of labor because if we give an epidural and it slows things down, we can speed it back up again with yeah. the administration of Pitocin? Or is there no difference because – I mean, here's this question. Is there a greater use of Pitocin in women who have had epidurals and is it, do you think, re- correlated by the epidural? No. No. Okay. No. And so that, that's the, the same the, prospective – there's only a handful of really high-quality prospective studies where the obstetrical management is controlled as opposed to – you know, people do what they want. Yeah. Yeah, so th- th- there's no difference. You, okay. You mentioned something. CSE? Yeah, combined spinal epidural, which is a way to get a very fast o- onset of the medication. Or you could just change the cocktail of the epidural medicine to include a, a local anesthetic that kicks in very quickly three, within three to five minutes and then doesn't last for very long, but at least you've you've got it there. So to back up and answer your other question, I mean, if women ask me, and sometimes I have been told, you know, shut up, just do the epidural. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, usually with a scream in there. <laughs> but, you know, if, if, if the expectation is you're going to deliver within 20 minutes, it's, I, I try to educate the woman. It's probably not worthwhile because mm-hmm. by the time I'm done, you're going to be delivering. Yeah, uh, I've seen a couple where it starts to kick in right after the baby comes out and it just seems. Yeah, so, so as you, we... Briefly mentioned the combined spinal epidural. So you can do the epidural, get into the epidural spot with the epidural needle, mm-hmm. at which point the, that membrane, the dura, is just going to be a couple, mm, couple millimeters straight ahead. Mm-hmm. And you could put a spinal needle through the epidural needle so you can inject a little bit of medicine into the spinal fluid so mm. that it kicks in in 90 seconds. Wow. So you go into the epidural space like you're doing a regular epidural, but then through that needle, you go in into the dura for a quick Right. It's quick kind of like in. a slam dunk because you're right there anyway. Yeah. Mm. And you get both. It's literally combined. Right. And that's um, useful sometimes for me personally, you know, and then um, some, at some locations, some hospitals, it's very popular. Uh-huh. And they do the combined spinal epidural for everybody because it kicks in quickly. Is this something you can people use can it as an for? ambulatory technique if you want. Oh, we're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, but is this something people can ask for and be like, hey, I want the epidural, but I want it to act really fast. Can I get the double? Well, so my advice on that is <clears throat> have the discussion with the anesthesiologist taking care of you and let them do, you know, uh, you run into trouble when you come in wanting the thing. Mm-hmm. As opposed to the principal, sure. Mm. Because how you can, with man, taking into account, like I said, uh, the medical aspect is taking into account what else is going on with the labor, the medical history, what the OB, team, obstetrician or midwife, what they're doing and managing. So it's not just oh, give me X. Mm-hmm. That's where you're going to run into conflict and and potentially not that may not be the right answer. 
Well, I'm not saying for you at that one time, it, but to at least <laughs> right, know and you. say, what are we doing? Are we doing a spinal? Are we doing epidural? Are we doing right, a you can ask about it and say, oh, you know, oh, well, gee, I need something that kicks in quickly. But yeah. like I said, you could use a uh, the fast onset local anesthetic. So I, I don't know that there's achieve a similar effect. Yeah, I mean, if it kicks in in three to five minutes versus a minute and a half, that's two or three contractions. Right, so that's not a huge difference Maybe unless you're about even. to deliver. Right. Um, and then, of course, so with the spinal, it's just a needle that goes and delivers the drug and comes out, whereas the epidural space, you're leaving a catheter in there. Uh, yes, excellent point of distinction. So the spinal is a one-shot deal. Mm -hmm. uh, Literally. You, yes. <laughs> you, you inject, the needle comes out, the medicine's there. So, uh, you know, uh, it'll last for a certain time, then we're off. With the epidural, you place a catheter, just like an intravenous catheter goes in the arm. So you can give as much fluid or medication as you need. You can turn it up, turn it down, change the medication. You can go, you're going to ask this later probably, but you can switch the medication and go from a walking epidural to a classic epidural. Well, now that you brought that up, <laughs> what is a walking epidural? Because usually, traditionally, you can't walk with an epidural, partially because your legs may be weak or numb or not functional, partially because of liability. Uh, patient safety. Or in patient safety. Yeah. Well, you, you don't want to be walking around a buckle. I mean, I've right. seen a couple of patients who, we, you know, we thought they were strong enough and they're walking around. And then, you know, one in a hundred you'll get who? Uh, buckle. Sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So if you want to do an ambulatory technique, you want to get high quality pain relief to be able to walk around. Right. So you could do that either with a walking epidural which I'll say strictly would be very low concentration of local anesthetic with some of the narcotic. Okay. Um, probably in the United States, I've um, been, if not the longest, one of the people doing that continuously. Walking epidurals? Yeah. I read a paper in, when I was working in New York and made an adaptation, because small adaptation, and it, I've been using it since 1994. Okay. Wow. That's cool. Um, so, yeah, you're talking to the right person. About the walking epidural, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it it works well for those who are early, for those who want to prioritize the mobility. What do you consider early? You know, four centimeters or less. Okay. It, or someone who is willing to accept partial relief. Right. So, it may, like I said, it may not work 100% for everybody. Um, but people who want it like it. But are walking epidurals offered everywhere at this point, no. or there you have no. to find where? Yeah, to you get have to them. ask around um, and just make sure it's offered wherever you plan to deliver. Yes, if that's what you want. So how do you convert that walking epidural when when she says mm, this is not enough? I need more. How do you convert that? You just add more anesthetic. Yeah, that's the the benefit of having an epidural. Usually we just say epidural, but it's true uh, ep the epidural catheter, mm -hmm. so you can get as much or as little medicine. So it's just a matter of giving, switching the solution, and uh, if you're having, if you want more medicine at the time, we can give you extra medicine to move you from incomplete relief to you know complete relief. I have another question too. Um, not every hospital seems to allow the patient to um, have like a button to control their epidural amount. Is that based on where you're at located also, or um, how does that, how do they know, like do they cap that with the person pushing the button, like you only have three times? I never pushed my button, but some people weren't offered a button. So I'm sure people out there might wonder, well, you know, well, if they hear about it. What is the button? What does it do? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> and why doesn't everyone have a button, <laughs> I guess? So when you start pushing people's buttons. <laughs> 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 and people get angry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, most commonly, I would think most places do offer the button option. So when you have that epidural, you get the initial medication to get you comfortable, and then you maintain it with a constant infusion or the new thing that's a, a new technique um, is that the machine itself will just sort of pulse it every now and then. But... Uh, the most common way is you just get a, a little bit of a slow drip running in um, with or without the patient option to give a little bolus. A little okay. extra. A little extra bolus. And there's programming. How quickly does that, do you feel that? 
Uh, I'll get to that one second. Okay. So, <laughs> so it is pro- there are safety features on the programming, so you can't overdose. You can't okay. do it all I, I, tell yeah. pa- I tell patients, don't worry about it. If you press three times in a row, you only get a certain amount as a safety feature. Got it. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the, the pump mechanics, most of them uh, would probably take, from the time you press the button on a common setting, it would probably take about five minutes for the meta extra medicine to run in and then another 10 for it to work. Okay. So it's not instant, like, oh, I feel better. No. Yeah. And that's different than if you have, um, for some surgeries, you get narcotic through the IV as a PCA, patient-controlled analgesia. That moves faster. And that's faster because that's intravenous, so you get that mm-hmm. high blood level, right. quick effect. The epidural, right, has to move, spread, and diffuse into mm-hmm. the, the nerve root. Do sense. the epidural drugs or the spinal drugs cross to the baby? Um, as a general answer, no. I am almost out of questions. Um, I, I know that Kristen on the way here was wondering... Well, I guess my, my last two thoughts are like this. Number one, we uh, many hospitals have policies that don't allow women to eat or drink during labor. Um, and I wondered what your thoughts on that, because they usually say, well, what if you end up um, needing to go into surgery? Uh, it's the anesthesia. You'll have a problem with the anesthesia. That's one. And then the other one is why commonly I see like all the support people get removed from the room when the epidural is placed. Okay, so <clears throat> eating during labor, uh, yeah, the National Society, the recommendation is still no solid foods. Okay. Uh, in case something happens in the older days, that was one of the ways people had bad things happen with anesthesia was aspiration. So the trend is still to try to prevent that from happening, even though it's happening a, a lot less often than in 50 years ago. So aspiration meaning because once you get some of the anesthesia, it slows down your digestion or turns off your digestion? or So things that you ate that are partially digested come back up? Yeah. In labor, you're not really properly digesting. Just like uh, if you get hit by a car and you come in as a trauma, the people will say, oh, yeah, I didn't I haven't eaten for six hours, and they're still throwing up chunks. So, so if you were to throw up and inhale solid food, that's a lot worse for you than if it's just liquid. And the, I think most places... Um, allow liquid mm-hmm. now, which would include, you know, Jello, sports drinks. So clear liquids. Okay. If, um, if you can read through it. So even that includes technically, uh, you know, weak tea or coffee with no, without milk. And products. ices. Hmm? And ices, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we want you to stay hydrated and you know get some calories and energy that way, and you're getting some also through the IV, but. Um, it's still the conservative approach for maximizing patient safety, which is trying to prevent the bad outcomes related to aspiration. And by aspiration, you mean if you're going to throw that up, throw the, throw up those chunks of food that you could accidentally suck it into your right, w- or if windpipe if, and get it into your lungs. If things, you know, I don't want to scare people. You know, if you start to hemorrhage and you become unconscious. Yeah. You know, uh, if you get the anesthetic and the doesn't happen, it's. Very unusual to happen, but if the level goes too high, if your blood pressure drops too low, you could pass out. If you have eclampsia, preeclampsia, eclampsia, you could seize and aspirate. So there are a bunch of settings oh, so in which— you're saying it's not even just from the anesthesia. There's other, other right. things that can happen that can make you aspirate. So the thinking on not eating during labor is because you don't, you don't digest as well and because there's many things that could put you into a compromised situation. Uh, we don't want to have food— that's partially digested, come up and potentially get brought into your lungs. Right. So that's from the patient safety perspective. That's not to say in 10 or 20 years that'll, that'll change. And you said the aspiration levels have gone down significantly. Yeah. Well, the old, old, old way was general anesthesia even for, for all the C-sections. So since we're not and doing general a, anesthesia very often. Not very often. Um, and then when we do, we intubate, right? So. Yeah. But you can still that's see things great. on the way in. Sure. It just seems like it's getting more and more remote, less possible that you'll aspirate. So then it might, because I think there's also some benefit to having nutrition, especially during a long labor. I'm not disagreeing with you on that aspect, but I'm just saying the current national standard the for patient safety, the guidelines. Yeah, I like are. to sort of analyze a mm-hmm. little bit. Because at some point you sort of, like we started off the podcast saying we provide information, let people make the choice. So at some point mm, it's, it seems like a choice that people might 
want to we might want to give them the choice yeah well on that one it may be the science leading the the, the choice but yeah I, uh, plus I, people eat at home before they get to the hospital so uh, you know there you go uh yeah and then the other one is why do you kick everybody out <laughs> um also basic patient safety um you know it is a sterile procedure people walk around i've had people walk around um not everyone understands the sterile field and even, you know, kicking up dust or doing things which are distracting, that's not good. And certainly I've seen the one person in the room that we allow, you know, faint mm-hmm. and fall. <clears throat> you know, there was a story in the paper, so it's... Oh, you let one person stay? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, some places, you're right, they don't just because they don't want anybody. Uh, I always let... We let one person stay. You kind of keep an eye on them, not touching yeah, the uh, stay, sterile instruments. Yeah, stay on the side in front of mom and not near my sterile stuff because otherwise I'm always looking back and people are, you know, it's natural to be curious and particularly the guys want to look. Uh-huh. I don't <laughs> know stuff. It's oh, they want to see thing. you do it or they want to yeah, see? Yeah, they're right. curious as to oh, what, uh-huh. what's going on and stuff. Interesting. And uh, and then if they faint, you have an extra patient to deal with. Yeah, no, I've had people hit, fall and hit their head and New have trauma. to leave the the area. What if mom moves while you're putting it in there? You always tell her, don't move, don't move. But what if she moves at just the wrong time? Is that? Well, that would increase the chance for, you know, poking into the, the door and stuff. Yeah. Can you hit something like, it, what if you hit the spinal cord? Uh, that would be rare and unfortunate. Yeah, okay. If you jump so much that you. Got all the way to the cord. Yeah. All right. Um, any last question from you, Kristen, before we pop out of here? Or Dr. Zakowski, anything you wanted to add that we left out? You've been so generous with you, your time. You, Yeah, well, you mentioned you had something there that I do want to say. It's a so misconception. Oh. Right, one, so the, one of the most common misconceptions or myths is that uh, epidural, you know, you can't move your legs. Mm-hmm. So like I said, you're not, I don't want to use, like using the P word. But other people say, oh, I don't want to be paralyzed. Yeah. So it's not paralysis, right? It's pain relief. And the goal is to be able to move your legs. So sometimes the medicine builds up. It can be harder as as time goes on. But it's not just one thing. And we can change it and, you know, increase, decrease. I joke, you know, with patients uh, I take care of. I say, you know, whatever you want, we can turn it up, turn it down. If you want it, you know, decaf, no foam latte, you, we'll, we'll get it for you. You know, that it's really a, a dialogue, you know, and a discussion and what, like I said, I have to take into account, number one, patient safety, what's medical protecting mom and baby. But with within that, there's usually a lot of room for a little more, a little less, you know, reassess. I tell patients, oh, if you start to feel that your legs are getting really heavy and you can't move, move them anymore, you know, buzz for the nurse so she can let me know. We can come evaluate you and see what we need to adjust. So it's a it's a dialogue, a discussion. We're working together towards a common goal. Mm-hmm. It's not just, oh, it's one thing, yes or no, flip on the light switch or not. Right. So, you know. That's that's good to know that there are, there are options and it's not, it's not one size fits all. Uh, I feel like sometimes I'm doing massage work on the feet, like reflexology work on the feet, and I'm surprised that she can feel it. But oftentimes they can feel it. Is that what you're intending for? Yes. Okay, that's great to know. I guess my question too is if so, say they got the first like initial dosage of the epidural and they don't press the button anymore, and that's not like it's not like a. You're really into that button. <laughs> well, because I have that. I want to know. It's not about the button. It's just like because I felt like I could feel a lot, and I never pressed after I got my initial dose, and I wanted to move. Um, to change my laboring position because normally then you're if you do get an epidural your only labor position that you're really allowed to have at that point is on your back and there at the hospital I was at maybe that's not in every hospital so I was just wondering if getting an epidural meant that you can only labor on your back or if you don't or if you have it early enough is there a way to then be able to move your position is that possible or is that just based on patient safety so I will uh, answer what you're asking. Okay. Uh, Is that a bad so, question? <laughs> so, yeah. So with a standard or regular epidural, which even that is different in different places, Okay. Um, 
you know, the exact combination of medicines changes a lot between hospitals and individuals. So uh, the goal, like I said, so it would be unusual to keep a pregnant woman on her back unless they're doing an exam or doing something because the when you're flat on your back, the weight of the baby cuts your circulation off a little bit. Yeah. And that's not good for the baby. So they would keep you on your side, turn you around. You know, we want you to move around even if you're not allowed out of bed, but moving around within the bed. Okay. As Dr. Berlin touched upon earlier, you know, um, there are ways to move around and to use the peanut ball and do some other maneuvers to help the baby descend and turn, you know, even being within the bed and with an epidural that make it equivalent to walking around. So you can ask then, that's my point, is that like that's something that you can work with your healthcare providers to ask to do? Yeah, I don't know how many, what percent of hospitals are doing this. Movement. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the, yeah, the movement and working as much as we do, you know, where places. I work um, in terms of actively moving um, a pregnant woman around in bed to sp- specifically, to, you know, to get the baby to drop down and rotate and do whatever needs needs to happen. Yeah. I'm sure that's pretty common. I, I'm I don't just know. unfamiliar I don't with that. I see that often in other hospitals. I no. do see it at your hospital. Okay. Regularly at your hospital. Um, I Now two other questions popped up. So, uh, Kristen, one's for you. What what did it feel like when you had the epidural placed? Um, I didn't feel much pain, actually. I think the person who did it was really good. But I was having very intense labor. So I think the hardest thing for me was to stay still because I had my baby was posterior. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so I couldn't. Labor? I, yeah, and I couldn't sit. So every... Every time I got a contraction, I would lean forward, and I, I the 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 nurses were so kind to me, and be like, "Well, breathe, honey," and I'm like, "I <laughs> try." <laughs> um, but he was really nice and uh, worked with me, so I would have a contraction, and he literally did it in between. In between, I I was wondering about that because um, many women tell me they don't want an epidural because they're afraid of the giant needle in their spine. I was really scared. About what it's going to feel like and just even having a needle in there. But actually, most of the people that get it tell me it was actually nothing compared to what they thought it was going to feel like. Yeah, be in consensus with that. Yeah, that's true. Often, but not always, of course, you know, a lot of women tell me, oh, it was uh, less, it was better than the uh, getting the IV started. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard people say that as well. Yeah. Um, well, how long does it take to careful about numbing it, up the skin and the deeper part of the yeah, skin. Yeah, so how do you do that? I'm fascinated by that. Just inject some local anesthetic through a tiny needle. Is that the first thing you do? Yeah. Well, after you make it sterile. Well, you make it <laughs> sterile with the yeah. yellowy stuff. And then um, a tiny, just under the skin? Yeah. I mean, I like to do a, within the skin, technically that's called intradermal, and then go deeper and numb up the, the tract that I think I'm most likely going to use. For the, the same epidemic. needle? Um. Most people use the same needle. I like to switch needles just because of the tactile feedback I get. But okay, so but I'm saying you just use the same the same drug. You just put a little right yeah, under the skin. Yeah, just some lidocaine, local anesthetic. And we get a little deeper and put some more. Yeah, get a little deeper and put some more, so that that path between the skin and the epidural sac, the space, epidural space, yeah, is, is uh, pretty numbed up. Exactly. So when you put the bigger needle in, they don't really feel it. Yeah magic. How long does the whole thing take? If you know how to help position yourself and stay still and, you know, usually it's really not very long. Could be anywhere from a couple minutes to 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. To just prep everything and... Yeah. How long does it take till you feel, like, confident? You're obviously great at what you do, but it just seems like something that takes a lot of practice till you really get it. Well, like most technical technical procedures, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a combination of, you know, experience and then um, innate ability. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me to sing. I would not be able to sing well. So you can can place an epidural like nobody else. (laughs) (laughs) Everybody has their talents. Yeah. Um, Yeah. My other question that popped into my head earlier was when you're ready to push or getting ready to push is – is it advised? Is it uh, someone who wants to be more active in their pushing, feel their pushing? 
Can you turn down the epidural? And if so, how long will it take till the effects start to wear off to where they can start feeling? Uh, yeah, well, like I said, at each point of labor, you know, we want to keep you at the right spot and anticipating when you're going to need to start pushing, which varies between people and different obstetricians start at different times. Mm -hmm. So that's what I keep referring to, the sort of the obstetric care plan and who's involved, which makes it always makes it interesting because it's not just one thing. But yeah, well, we'll can turn it if you have too much. We can turn it down uh, beforehand, or uh, usually it takes, depending on where you're starting from, it could take 30 to 60 minutes to wear down. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. And, and and that's when you'd be able to start walking again? Uh, not enough to walk. No, that, How long I guarantee that, that you could walk again be a bit longer than that. But it also depends, like I said, how numb you are to start. Mm-hmm. Okay. It was food for thought. It's just based on an experience that I saw, and I wondered if that would, would happen. Anyway, you've been incredibly generous with your time. Um, you're a treasure trove of information. I could talk to you for hours. I learned so many new things today. Um, our uh, listeners can get a glimpse of you at home by checking out your book, C-Section, which we didn't even talk about really today. C-Section, How to Avoid, Prepare for, and Recover from Your Cesarean, which is available on Amazon. And um, my hope is that you'll come back and do another episode just on that. Okay, and and uh, don't forget, I do. We'll have more information for for people coming out, either at safebabysystem.com, or um, setting up a, a new, maybe an easier portal, inpowerdelivery.com. So safebabysystem.com or yeah. inpowerdelivery.com, we can find you. Right. And, um, and, and I'll have more information like how to position, how to help position properly and some of the other things. Amazing. Can't wait to see it. Yeah, me too. Uh, So thanks again for being here with us. And Kristen, thanks for joining us again uh, at home. Share us with your friends and visit us online for access to our blog documentaries, The Real Midwives, and other pregnancy and parenting resources at informedpregnancy.com.